Hello, I'm Brian Young, and today we're going to be covering 26302, Conductor Selection and Calculations. The main point of overcurrent protection is to keep the wire cool. We have to allow the wires enough time to dissipate the heat from the current running through them in order to not start a fire. So overcurrent protection is way below the melting point of the copper in that conductor. It's to limit the amount of current, to limit the amount of heat, so that there is no deg degradation, degradation of the insulation around that conductor. When we overheat the insulation, the insulation becomes brittle, then it cracks off, falls off the wire, and now we no longer have an insulated conductor. We have a bare conductor. And inside of a metal box, a bare conductor is a bad thing. So let's take a look at the book, Level 3, Module 2, Conductor Selection and Calculations. <clears throat> Objective, select conductors for various applications, identify overcurrent protection for branch circuit and feeders, identify protect, uh, the properties of conductors. Trade terms, the American wire gauge, it's a gauge that we use to size wires. Uh, the American wire gauge, you should have already learned, um, as the number, gets smaller, the wire size gets larger. It's how many pooling blocks they pulled the copper through. So if they pull the, the copper through one pooling block, it's a number one. And if they pull it through two, it's a number two. And if they pull it through three, it's a number three. And every additional pooling block makes the wire smaller and smaller and smaller. So a number eight is larger than a number 10, is larger than a number 12, is larger than a number 14. So right away here on page one, left-hand side, it says solid wire is the least flexible form of a conductor and is merely one strand of copper. So a solid conductor is the least flexible form of that conductor. The degree of hardness is the temper. Temper refers to the relative hardness of a conductor. So you have soft drawn, medium hard drawn, and hard drawn. If you're using an extension cord on a job site, you want it to be hard drawn. It, it can take the abuse of the construction site a lot more, a lot better. Um, again, we said that uh, solid conductors are one strand. Uh, stranded conductors are multiple strands. And what they do is they have one center strand and then they put six around it. So the first uh level is seven strand and then they come in and they put uh 12 around the outside of that and they end up with 19 strands and then they put 18 additional strands and they end up with 37 strands if you notice it's always an odd number because there's always one in the center so you have one strand or seven strands or 19 strands or 37 strands. It's always an odd number. Uh, we have copper and aluminum conductors and we have compact conductors. Compact conductors, if you notice, the strands are not round. They're shaped like the uh, ice cubes in an igloo. So it's a rhombus or a uh, trapezoid, and they all stack up together. That's compact conductors. It gives you the same ampacity in a smaller cross-sectional area than a regular stranded wire. A stranded wire, by the way, has a larger cross-sectional area than a solid wire because of all of the space in between the stranding. So if you're talking about circular mill area, uh, that number 12 wire has uh, 6,530 circular mills. If it's a stranded conductor, those seven strands 
added together will make 6,530. But the area between the conductors also takes up room. So that stranded conductor is larger in physical diameter than the solid conductor. Here on the right hand side of uh, page three, it says in most cases an overcurrent device must be connected at the point where the conductor to be protected receives its supply. This is 2040-21. Uh, this is called the TAP rules. 24021 tells us that the conductor must be protected for overcurrent at the point where the uh, conductor receives its supply. And then there are several exceptions to that, and those exceptions are the TAP rules. Uh, it says further down in general, grounded conductor, that's a neutral, must have a wider gray finish. When this is not practical for, for conductors larger than number six, American wire gauge, marking the, its terminations white is an acceptable method for identifying the conductor. Tagging is also acceptable. So six and smaller have to have an outer finish that are white and, or gray, uh, larger than number six, number four, number two, number one. You can mark them with tape, paint, or tagging them. Okay. Uh, I don't have any highlights here on pages four or five. This is a nice single phase panel, 240 volt. It has uh, two ungrounded conductors, one serving uh, one side and the other serving uh, the other side. Basically, these circuit breakers will alternate uh, A phase, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, all the way down. But again, I don't have any highlights on that page. Over on page six, on the left hand side, uh, table 310.15B16. However, the ampacities are sub subject to correction factors that must be applied where the ambient temperature for the conductor's uh, location exceeds 30 degrees Celsius. We'll take a look, closer look at that in the code book. It says here, for example, if six number 10 gauge TW current carrying conductors are installed in a single raceway when the ambient temperature is 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, the ampacity of the 30 amp uh, conductors must be derated or reduced by 80% because of the number of current carrying conductors in a raceway. Uh, NEC 31015B3A, and then reduced again by a correction factor of 0.82 for table 31015B2A because of the ambient temperature. So, if you have a code book, you should have a code book, you must have a code book. Table 31016, 31015B16 is one that you are going to want to highlight. You're going to have to put a flag on it, some way of recognizing 31015B16. Table 31015B16 says it's the allowable ampacity of insulated conductors rated up to and including 2000 volts with a 60 degree Celsius temperature rise through a 90 degree Celsius temperature rise. They're talking about the insulation protecting the conductor. Not more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway cable or the earth direct buried, okay? Based on an ambient temperature of 30 degrees Celsius, ambient means the air around us. So if you're hotter than 30 degrees Celsius, which is about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, you have to derate because of the temperature. If you have more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway, you have to derate. Again, it's all about cooling. If you have more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway, it's hard for them to dissipate their heat. They're all in there heating each other. So they're trying to give off the heat, but they're, they're, they're close by each other and they're heating each other up and they're heating up the air inside that raceway. So we have to derate the ampacity of those conductors to make sure that we do not exceed the temperature rise limitations of the conductors. Now, I suggest to you that you get a, a highlighter and you highlight 
the first three columns, that's copper. And you take a pencil and you shade in the next three columns, which is aluminum. So th these three are copper and these three are aluminum. And you'll see that copper has a better ampacity than aluminum. Uh, just use number TW as an example. A number 12 has an ampacity of 20 amps copper, only 15 amps aluminum. Okay. Again, uh, if we talk about uh, THHW or THWN, uh, number 12 has 25 amps ampacity. Uh, aluminum only has 20 amps ampacity. So copper is a better conductor than aluminum. But these tables are the ampacity rating of conductors. Not more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway, cable, direct buried in the earth. Uh, if you're talking about cable tray, not more than three conductors bundled together in a pyramid shape, uh, current carrying conductors that is. Back on Table 310.15b2a, ambient temperature. If we're above 30 degrees Celsius, we have to derate. So here's the 30 degrees Celsius and it shows us the multiplier is one. So everything's good at 30 degrees Celsius. If we get higher than that, 31 to 35 degrees Celsius, ambient temperature, the air around us, uh, if we're talking about a 75 degrees Celsius temperature rise cable, we can only put 94%, 0.94. If we're talking about 36 to 40 degrees Celsius, that same conductor is only good for 88%, 0.88. So this is another table that you need to be familiar with in your code book, 31015B2A. That's for 30 degrees Celsius ambient temperature. Uh, 31015B2B is based on a 40 degree Celsius uh, ambient temperature. Here, 31015B2B is for 40 degree Celsius wire. Uh, 40 degree Celsius wire has a different insulation. In fact, if we look at uh, 31015B16, we'll see the types of insulation are TW, UF. Uh, RHW, THHW, THW, THWN, even some of the 90 degrees Celsius insulations are RHH, RHW, THHN, THHW. If we go to 31015B18, uh, this is based on 40 degrees Celsius, and look at the types of insulation, type Z, type, type FEP, FEPB, PFA, SA, these are different conductors, they're different insulation. They're a higher temperature rating. Instead of 60, 75, and 90 degrees Celsius, they have 150 degrees Celsius, 200 degrees Celsius, 250 degrees Celsius. And these could be used in an oven, like the wires that go to the heating elements of an oven. They will have an asbestos sleeve in it that, they, that they ride in to protect them but they'll also have an insulation rating that is 200 or 250 degrees Celsius because it gets awful hot, you know. But uh, if you have to adjust the temperature for a 30 degrees Celsius conductor, you need to know what the insulation value is of that conductor. If you got it out of the 60 degrees Celsius column, stay with the 60 degrees Celsius column and come down and find your multiplier. If it's the center column, the 75 degrees Celsius column, stay in the center column. 90 degrees Celsius, stay in the column. Stay in the same column where you found the insulation of the wire when you're choosing uh, a derating factor for temperature. Also, they said that if we had uh, more than three current carrying conductors in a raceway, we would also have to derate. And here is 31015B3A telling us just that. If we have four, five, or six conductors, we're limited to 
seven, eight, or nine, we're limited to 70%. 10 to 20 conductors, 50%. You have to cut the opacity of that conductor in half. And again, that's for uh, dissipation of heat. It's to allow those conductors to cool off so that we do not uh, exceed the temperature limitation of that conductor. Okay. So here's their example on page six on the left hand side. They're talking about that. They say, for example, if six number 10 gauge TW current carrying conductors are installed in a single raceway where the ambient temperature is 40 degrees Celsius. Now we have to derate twice. We have to derate once because we have more than three current carrying conductors in the raceway. And we have to derate a second time because our ambient temperature is above 30 degrees Celsius. The ampacity of 30 amps must be derated or reduced to 80% because of the number of current carrying conductors in the raceway and then reduced by, again, by a correction factor of 0.82%, uh, or 82%, for NEC table 31015B2A because of the ambient temperature. So here they're saying that they would take that 30 amps times 80%, and they get 24 amps, they multiply that times 82%, and they get 19.68 amps. You could not put that conductor on a 20 amp circuit breaker if you have six of them in the conduit and the ambient temperature is 40 degrees Celsius, you have to put them on a 15 amp circuit breaker. You cannot, uh, you cannot exceed the temperature rating of the conductor. And 20 amps would exceed the temperature rating of that conductor. Okay. Uh, they're talking about circuit breakers over on page eight, seven. I don't have any highlights. I don't have any highlights on page eight. Page nine, they start talking about transformers, location of overcurrent protection device. Here's a transformer, you need to protect that transformer. You can protect that transformer either on the primary or on the secondary. And if it's on the primary, uh, it has to be, uh, I think it's 125% of the rated current. Uh, on the secondary, it's 250% of the rated current. Here on page nine, left-hand side, it says, NEC chapter nine, table eight, gives the physical properties and electrical resistance. Okay, so if you're looking for electrical resistance uh, of a conductor, you would go to chapter nine, table eight in your code book, and it tells you what the resistance is of each conductor, each type of conductor. Uh, over here on page 10, left-hand side, close to the bottom of the page, says if the conductors are installed in areas with different ambient temperatures, a further duration is required or deduction is required. For example, if the same set of four 4 uh THHN conductors were installed in an industrial area where the ambient temperature uh, averaged, and then it continues on the next column here, uh, 35 degrees Celsius. Look at the correction factor for NEC table 31015B2A and B. You'd have to derate. You'd have to derate because of the temperature, the ambient temperature. This table one is a reprint from the code book. It's telling us from four to six conductors in a raceway, we are, are limited to 80% of the ampacity of those conductors in that raceway. Uh, Right-hand side, 1.2.1 color coding. It says the high leg, if you have a delta system, the high leg of a 122 40-volt grounded three-phase four-wire delta system must be marked with an orange color. So instead of uh, a black, red, blue, it would be black, orange, blue. Make sure that the B phase, the high leg, has orange color. You have to mark that high leg with an orange color. Page 11, left-hand side, top of the page says, Unless allowed by the NEC exceptions, a grounded conductor must have a white or gray finish when this is not practical. Uh, for conductors larger than number six gauge, marking the terminals uh, white is an acceptable method of identifying the conductors. You can mark them white or gray or put a tag on them, use paint or tape. 
high leg connection, NEC section 408.3E1. So it requires that the panel board supplied by a three phase four wire delta service have the high leg connected to the center phase, the B phase. So the high leg has to be the B phase and it has to be uh, coated, color coded orange in color. Here on page 12, sizing of conductors. It says voltage drop in all electrical systems. The conductors should be sized so that the voltage drop does not exceed 3% for power, heating and lighting loads, or a combination of these. Furthermore, the maximum total voltage drop for conductors, uh, feeders and branch circuits combined should not exceed 5%. So a feeder can have a 3% um, uh, voltage drop. A branch circuit can have a 3% voltage drop, but both feeders and, and branch circuits combined can only have a maximum voltage drop of 5%. Uh, this is NEC section 21019A1, informational note number four. And then on the right hand side, way down at the bottom of the page, it says the most common sizes used for light and power install, uh, installations range from 4 watt to number 14 gauge. They're not saying that those are the only sizes of wire in the world. They're saying the most common sizes for building uh, of a house or a small business are four watt to number 14. We don't use anything smaller than number 14 for branch circuits. We can use smaller wires, but not for a branch circuit. On page 13, left-hand side, circular mill unit uh, of conductor area. It says the mill is equal to a thousandth of an inch. So it's small enough to measure and express these sizes very accurately. For example, a wire that has a diameter of 0 0.055 inches or 55 thousandths of an inch is simply 55 mils. So if it were a quarter of an inch, if it were 0 0.250, we would call that 250 mils in diameter. For square conductors such as bus bar, the square mill is used. So we would multiply the width and the depth, it says, to determine the area of a square conductor, multiply one side by the other, measuring the sides either in mils or a thousandths of an inch. So if we have a square conductor here and it's 250 mils by 250 mils, we'll multiply those together and get 62,500 square mils. We have to specify square mils because what they have us do for round conductors is a little bit strange. They do exactly the same calculation as this square conductor. They take the diameter and they square it. They don't take the radius squared times pi like we're supposed to, two pi or two, two pi r, the, uh, the radius times two, which is diameter times pi. They don't do that. They do diameter times diameter as if this were a square conductor, but it's not. So in order to uh, adjust for that, they don't call them square mills, they call them circular mills. So they say 62,500 circular mills. A circular mill is 0.7854 times a square mill. So square mills, circular mills. <clears throat> And you can convert when you have a bus bar. If it's a square bus bar and you take the square inch area of it and it says 62,500 square mils, well, then you can uh, take a calculator. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, probably not. 62,500 and you can divide by 0 0.7854. And it'll tell you it's actually 79,577 circular mills. So now you can look in the code book 31015B16 and see what the ampacity of that square conductor would, have, would be in circular mills. So we can use a conversion. Here, oh, at the very bottom of page 14 on the left-hand side, they're saying uh, resistance of copper per foot is the length of one conductor must first be multiplied by two because you have a wire going out and you have a wire coming back. So when they tell you it's 150 feet to the gate or to the pool pump or to whatever, it's actually 300 feet of wire. 
there's 150 feet of wire going out. There's 150 feet of wire coming back. And then it says refer to NEC table, uh, chapter nine, table eight, to find the resistance of the number 10 solid copper conductor. And they're saying it's 1.21 ohms per thousand feet. We're going to use uncoded in the code book unless we're told otherwise. So we're going to turn way back to the back of the code book, way back here. And we're going to get to chapter nine, table eight. I'm in uh, Annex C right now, and I don't want to be in Annex C. I want to be in uh, chapter, that's Annex B. Here we go. Here's chapter nine, table eight. Here's chapter nine, table eight, conductor properties. And they're saying they're coming down to a number 10. They said it was stranded, I believe. So seven strands, one is uh, solid, seven is stranded. And we'll come over to uh, ohms per thousand feet. Don't do kilometers, we don't do metric, per thousand feet. And this is uncoded ohms per thousand feet. And they're saying for a number 10, they're using 1.2, using 1.24 or 1.21. They're actually using 1.21. They must have said solid and I missed it. Uh, no, I'm sorry, excuse me, what am I saying? Uh, 1.24, that's for stranded. That's the, that's the seven strands. So uh, they were using 1.21. They must have been using a solid conductor in that, in that example. But you'd use the ohms per thousand feet and you can use that calculation in order to calculate the entire resistance of a conductor. So here they've got 300 feet divided by 1,000 feet because it's ohms per 1,000 feet gives us 0.30 ohms for that 300 feet. Multiply the result times the resistance of 1.21 ohm, ohms, and it tells us that we have a total resistance for that wire of 0.363 ohms. 0.363 ohms. Okay. Over here on page 16, left-hand side, calculating voltage drop, the size of the conductor required to connect an electrical load to the source of supply is determined by the load current in amps, the permissible voltage drop, which we said was 3% for a branch circuit or 3% for a feeder, or a total of 5% altogether, okay? Uh, I'm going to give you two different formulas, actually three different formulas. One of them is going to be for three phase, but I'm going to give you two different formulas here. They, they uh, here in the NCCER, they give us two different ways of calculating voltage drop. So here we are. Let's see what I've got going here. So. I go to my pen tool and uh, we're going to say voltage drop equals ohms per thousand feet times the current in amps times twice the length, twice the length divided by Circular mill area. I'm sorry, no, let me, let me change that. I'm doing the first one first, excuse me. Divided by a thousand. Now the reason it's divided by a thousand is because this is ohms per thousand feet. Per thousand feet. So we're gonna divide by a thousand. We're gonna multiply times the length of the conductor. So let's just get some numbers here. Let's say they said 1.21 ohms per thousand feet times, I'm just making up numbers, I'm not gonna use the ones out of the book. 23 amps, let's say we had 23 amps, and let's say it was 200 feet away, well, if it's 200 feet away, we're gonna double it, and we're gonna make it 400 feet. 
I could have written two times 200. I'm not gonna bother doing that. I'm just gonna write 400, okay? Right there, you know that that's two times 200 feet. So we have 23 amps at 200 feet times two conductors, 1.21 ohms per thousand feet divided by a thousand. So divided by a thousand. And then, where are you? And we just simply do the math. So I'll do 1.21 times 23 amps times 400 feet divided by 1,000. And look, we got 11.132 ohms. 11. 0.132 ohms. That's our total. Now, we're going to do a second formula. That was the first formula. That's using ohms per thousand feet. Uh, there's another way to do this where we're going to say a voltage drop equals the constant for copper and the constant for copper equals 12.9 ohms and the cop constant for aluminum is 21.21.2 ohms something like that 21 or 21.2 ohms so we have a, a constant 12.9 times 23 amps times our 400 feet divided by, and I think they were using a number 10 wire, so we're gonna use the circular mill area for a number 10 wire, 10,380. We would find that in chapter nine, table eight, there's my circular mill area of a number 10 wire. So let's do that. Let's see what we get here. We'll clear this. We'll do 12.9, which is the constant, times 23 amps times 400 feet, and we'll divide by 10,380 circular mills. And look what we got, 11.43. We got very, very close to the same answer. We got 11.433, 11.433. So this is two ways to do it. Like I say, we, oops, that didn't work there. 11.13 or 11.43. So we're off by three tenths of an ohm. We're not gonna worry about that. That's not gonna bother us that much. Uh, that's two different ways to do it. You can use the ohms per thousand feet or you can use the circular mill area of the conductor. Okay. So here on page 17, uh, on the right-hand side, it says the maximum voltage drop of 3%. That's for branch circuits or feeders. If you have a 120 volt circuit, and you have a maximum of 3% volts voltage drop, you're limited to 3.6 volts on that branch circuit. You can't have more than 3% volts voltage drop. Okay, uh, pages 18 and 19. Oh, I told you I was gonna give you three formulas. Let me give you the third formula. Uh, I just realized, uh, let me give you the third formula here, there. How much would you pay? But wait, there's more. So the third formula that we have uh, is very similar to this one. Voltage drop times the constant uh, equals the constant times 23 ohms, or amps, excuse me, times 400 feet divided by the circular mill area. This, the third formula is for three phase. So we're actually going to end up with the voltage drop equals my constant, which is 12.9 for copper, times the current, 23 amps, 
times. Now we said it was three phase. So instead of doing two times uh, 200 feet, instead of doing two times 200 feet the length, we're going to do the square root of three times the length, 200 feet. And then we'll divide the whole thing by the circular mill area, 10,380. So if we had this same 200 feet, 23 amps, copper, 12.9, but it was a three phase circuit instead of a single phase circuit, we'd, mul we'd multiply times the square root of three instead of two. So we do 12.9 times 23 times the square root of three. And I don't know how to do it on this calculator, so I'm just gonna put the number in 1.732, that's the square root of three, times 200 feet divided by the square mill, of uh, the circular mill area, 10,380 for a number 10 copper conductor. And look, our voltage drop is only, uh, or our, our, yeah, what did I say before? Yeah, our, whoops. Our voltage drop is only 9.9 .9 volts. I wrote this wrong last time, sorry. 9.9 .9 volts. Here, and nobody even corrected me here. These are volts. I don't know why I put a, an ohm. That's volts and that's volts. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for voltage drop. I don't know why I put ohms. I lost my head there for a second. But, uh, oops, come on now. Come on, eraser, erase. Got one job to do. Do it. There. So I should have said volts. I, I misspoke and said ohms. I zigged when I should have zagged, but there you go. That's 11.13 volts, 11.43 volts. Like you can see, that's literally the same thing. We're not going to worry about three tenths of a volt. <clears throat> okay. So that's your that's your third formula using the square root. A square root of three instead of using two, use 1.732. Okay. Okay. Uh, pages 18 and 19, I have no highlights. Page 20 is the summary. Okay, very good. That's this concludes 26302 conductor selection and calculations. Uh, read your ebook. Do the review questions, do the concept check questions. If you have any questions, uh, notify your instructor. And I hope that uh, I hope that this was useful, informative. I hope you got something out of it. And as always, work safe, work smart, and use your PPE. Thank you. <laughs>